going to talk to you about parsers tonight. Just a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a developer at Habitat as well, just upstairs. Um, but I've only recently moved to Haskell and PureScript. Before that, I spent a lot of time uh, using Scala. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, Belware and on GitHub as well, and you can find this presentation. Uh, I'm talking about parsers and parser combinators because I believe parsing is a truly fundamental problem uh, in many ways. Uh, first of all, a lot of the code we write is very similar to parsers. For example, if you're um, extracting an address from a, a form, you get validating data, well, you're, you're very much extracting structure from rough data. And then if you go next level, well, our languages very much rely on, on parsers. That's like the first, the first brick, really. So without parsers, there would be no, there would be no programming languages. Without programming languages, no Scala, and we simply wouldn't be here tonight. Uh, if you dig a bit deeper, even, I believe uh, parsers very much reflect the core of what we do. In the age of information, as developers, we're very much on the front line trying to extract and, and refine data out of the chaotic world in which we, we operate. And if you let me to stretch just a little bit further down, I, I think it's also very human. I mean, we live in a very chaotic world that just simply wasn't made for us, and, but we so desperately want to understand it and make sense of it. And that's where the, the, the feeling of absurd comes from. Uh, simply, we try to understand and try to make sense but it's a very much like a self-imposed problem and there is no there is no solution there is no there is no way out and that's that's there is no absolute answer to to passing to software development and arguably to to life itself that's what i have <laughs> uh well more seriously i mean once you've said that what can we do well you could simply give up just burn it all down and don't look back and it's pretty tempting at times um, otherwise you can simply ignore the problem altogether and just do a, a leap of faith and just rely on superior forces and get your passes generated for you by the holy god of yak or something but i believe there is another way and we should simply embrace the the absurdity of it all and build from scratch and try to use our tools to understand the various trade-offs and try to go step by step and try to see where we can go and what we can build and try to understand the design space. And that's what I suggest we do tonight. What I want to build tonight, if we have enough time, is a parser that's able to, given an indication of the size of the message, parse it message size and then pass the relevant message uh, behind it based on the site. Some of you probably see where I'm going. Anyway, let's start from scratch. So parser, we want to pass a specific value, hence the uh, a parameter, that's what we want to pass. Arguably the simplest parser we can build is this one. We want to pass exactly one specific character. Fine, so for example, character A, character B. Um, then we can simply run it. So you take your parser, you give it a string, and it's going to try to run it on that string. So get the first character, make sure it's the right one, and returns an option because it might fail. If you run it, empty string, get an error. Wrong character, get an error. And if you give it the right character, all good. Brilliant. Um, that's obviously pretty simple, but as the most fundamental parser we can build, we're going to build on top of it. We're not animals, so let's just have proper error types. Uh, end of files, if we reach the end of the input, earlier than expected, unexpected if, if we get the wrong character. So rewrite this function as basically the same thing, just swearing the right um, errors in our ISA. Rerun it, same behavior, except you get the, the proper errors out of it. Switch off my screen, that's fine. Back on. Right, all good. Um, so that's 
that's good, all, all good and working. Let's move to the next step and just add more complexity. So let's add or. The, the idea is try to run the first parser, and if it fails, fall back on the second one and try to run the second one. Same thing, try to pass character A. If it fails, try to pass B. The run function didn't touch the exactly part. That's the same one. The all one simply run the first one. If it fails, run the second one with the original input. Otherwise, return the result. Pretty much what you would expect. So if you run it, unexpected character works. But then if you give it A or if you give it B, I don't know if you can see, but basically works as, as intended. That's all good. So now we have only two very simple parsers, but we can already see the power of parser combinators. So the whole idea, the, the gist of it really is build a very limited language of very simple parsers and then use the host language, Scala in this case, with high other functions to combine those simple parsers to build uh, much more complex and subtle parsers. So that, that's what we're going to do. Um, this is just a useful tool, so that's non empty list. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it. So it's one or more elements. And that's going to be useful to build the one off parser. So, given a non empty list of parsers, I'm going to chain them together using the all parser, and it's going to try all of them, or potentially all of them in the list, uh, one by one. I switch on my screen again, Jesus. Um, so, once we have it, we can create all the digits, so all from zero to nine, and then shove it into one off, and it's gonna to try to pass uh, any digit. Uh, now it's gonna return a car, we'll get back to it later. But if you run it, pretty much what you expect, if you give it a Z, it's not gonna be happy about it. If you give it a digit, it's gonna be passed properly. Um, so that's an example of what parser combinators really mean. You have very simple parsers, and then very powerful combinators, and you can get powerful parsers out of it. Um, if we look closely at our run function, um, there is a bit of a problem with it. So if you succeed to pass the, the A, then it's simply going to, well, what, what, what happens to B, C, D? It just, just disappears, which arguably is a bit of a problem. It's very valuable information for the user to know whether the whole input was passed, or if there was something left at the end. So we should update our definition of run to return that string. So if you look at the return type now, it's the value we want to pass and the left of our input. Only had to touch just a little bit the um, exactly part of the run function, just returning the uh, tail of the input, and it's safe because we're inside the head option uh, block. So it's not going to crash at runtime, hopefully, touching with it. Uh, if you run it, exactly the same behavior as before, but you notice that you actually do get the value you pass and the leftover input. And that's also be, going to be extremely useful for what we're going to build right now. Let's try to add a new parser, which is AND, which is a dual of OR. And it's going to run the first parser, get the value, run the second one, get the value, and create the, uh, the Cartesian product. A and B, pass A and then pass B. Run function, run, as I said, run the first one, run the second one using the leftover input from the first one and then combine the two values and uh, the, the leftover input for the second one. It's getting a bit messy and I don't like it and I'll get back to it, but let's just run it first. If you run it, empty string obviously fails, wrong character obviously fails, but if you give it A, it's not enough because we want A and B. So it's going to complain about end of input. And if you give more data, it's happily going to pass A and B and then left over input. That's all good. Now, as I said, not too happy with our definition of run. It's getting just too messy it's because we're trying to take care of state, trying to take care of errors, and all at once. So what I want to do is really focus on my passes, and I don't want to think of that. So I'm just going to pull um, ScalaZ in the project and Say, give me a monad that takes care of errors, give me a monad that takes care of state, and just take care of it, and I'll just do my own job, right? Um, unfortunately, it's not that simple. We can't quite do uh, the two monad constraints, so you have to uh, do a bit of plumbing, but that's just, that's very much a one-off. It's not so bad. 
painful, but it's not so bad. Once you've done that, that's it. Um, once you have it, we can rewrite um, our run function in a much better way, um, arguably. So this is just a, a little helper called next um, to give you an idea of how it works. Our state is going to be um, the leftover input, or the input we haven't processed yet. And so we get it. If it's empty, well, clearly end of file error. If it's not empty, then we can put the tail of um, the input back in the state and return the head. That's going to be very useful to define a run function. So exactly is probably the most interesting one. Call next, so get the first character. Make sure it's the right one. If not, throw an expected error, return the character. Always pretty much the same as before, just a bit more fancy stuff, but it's basically the same idea. And and looks amazing. I mean, just quite simply, first one, flat map, second one, psh, create a tuple out of it. That's it, done. It is extremely satisfying compared to the previous version. Um, well, I've only defined the constraints I want. So I want state, I want error, but I didn't give any actual type. So that's what I'm going to do right now. So for error handling, simply either error or, or A. And for state handling, just going to use the um, state monad or state t monad transformer. Bit more plumbing. Uh, really, I mean, Scala should be able to, to, to figure out a lot of it. Probably couldn't, couldn't get it to work exactly the way I wanted. Once again, that would be a one-off, so it's not too bad anyway. But what you get is a natural transformation from parser to a result type. So for any parser, the run function is very much uh, transforming it into the type we want. And then you can define um, evil function. Takes a parser, takes an input, and apply it. And we should be getting the same result if we compile it down to a result, run it, and yeah, it works pretty much the same way as before, except the value and the leftover input are inverted. But that's the only difference. So we get a much nicer run function that is very much focused on what we want to do and not taking care of, like all the state and errors are managed for us. Um, all right, so if we want to add a bit more power to our parsers, I've removed the and parser and I've added a pure, which just lifts the value to parser and a bind, which take a parser, a function from A to parser B, returns to parser B. Probably see where I'm going right now. Uh, obviously, I turned parser into a monad, so I define the instance for it. And also with the um, all parser, we get a plus for free. So that's a um, universally quantified um, semigroup. What it means is that for any given A, uh, parser A is a semigroup. So that's really nice because then we get all the combinators from um, Scala Z or Cats if you use Cats for free, and we can start. God. And we can start um, redefining parses or, or using using um, using Scala Z. So for example, and becomes quite simply parser A double parser B. Is that it for you? Um, digits also becomes much nicer. So for non-empty list of all the digits, now. As it's a monad, it extends functor, so you get map for free, and then as it's a semigroup, you get full map for free. So it's simply going to turn you, your car into an int and just going to collapse all your parses together and, and, and <coughs> use the uh, all combinator. Uh, you can define maybe for a given parser. If it succeeds, um, wrap it into sum. If it fails, wrap it into none. Uh, obviously using options because otherwise type inference doesn't work, but that's the, that's the gist of it. Uh, you can also define two very interesting parsers uh, defined in terms of each other. So sum is basically one or more, and many is zero or more, so it's the plus and start in uh, regular expressions. So sum tries to run the parser once, and then tries to run the zero or more one, and makes the list out of it, and many tries to run the sum, so one or more, and if it fails, returns the, the empty list. So they call each other. Quite, it's pretty neat. Uh, run function has barely changed. So we get pure, which is simply point, because m is a monad, and bind is just simply calling flat map with f in the right place. So once again, very nice, thanks to uh, monad transformers and, well, uh, the MTL style uh, monad constraints. Just the plumbing, repeated it. 
And now we can define things like uh, lowercase, so for like any character, lowercase character format that exactly, and it's gonna work just fine. So we can then combine them together. So I want a lowercase character and one or more digits, compile it down, run it, and you can see the last example, one uh, lowercase character, four and two uh, well, digits, and then left over input. So that's all passed uh, nicely. So all working uh, just fine as expected. And now we're finally reaching uh, what I wanted to build. So first pass the digit, then pass the um, separator, the column, and then based on the result of the first parser, so the, the integer n, replicate the lowercase parser n times. And if you run it, if you give just characters, it's not gonna work. If you give the size, but we don't give a separator, also gonna fail, at least expecting the colon. But if you do give size, colon, and some characters, it's probably gonna pass the, the three characters. And that's only possible thanks to the whole monad, uh, but monadic parser, it wouldn't be possible without it. Here we are, very nice. Um, that was extremely satisfying, but then always want to like see what the next step is. I'm not gonna tell you about my whole summer spent on my couch because of my fractured ankle reading the Idris book, but I just want to, I just want you to look at this. So that's how, so for those of you who are not familiar with Idris, it's a dependency type language. So you do have much more power and the difference between type and values is much more blurry. So it's very interesting. So the type to type here is very much our uh, A parameter in our parser, it's the same thing. But what's really interesting is this parameter. So there is a type level Boolean, which tracks a type level, whether our parser are gonna consume input or not. And the whole idea behind it is to say, well, if I can prove that my, my parser is gonna consistently consume data and that my input data is finite, well then at some point we're gonna reach the end of the input data and so our parser is gonna terminate. And you know, I was like, well, type level booleans, you know, surely it's doable in Scala, right? Surely. Um, all right, so type level booleans, defining traits, uh, defining the uh, and operation or operation. I'm not sure that's the best way of doing it, but that's like one way of doing it. Uh, and it, it did the trick for me, but uh, there might be uh, better ways. Um, that wasn't quite enough because basically they're defined on, white, on one side and then they did proofs for the uh, and and or operations. So I just use implicits and that is a pretty awful trick. I'm not gonna explain the whole of it, but basically just saying, I can prove that A and true is equal to A. Like I know it's true, like, Compiler won't believe me, but I know it's true. And, and you'll see why later. Um, but now we can define our parser again. And not only we have the A parameter, but also have like a Boolean parameter, which is gonna keep track of whether we consume input or not. So exactly, obviously it consumes input because it looks at the next one. Pure doesn't because it's just lists the value. Or more interesting, the only way to know, the only way for a all parser to consume input if it's if the two of them consume input, then we're sure that the final parser is gonna consume input. And is, well, bind is the other way around. If the first parser or if the first parser returned by the function uh, consume input, if one of them consume input, then the whole block is gonna consume input. That's the same thing, just rewritten together and you can see why I, I use the uh, implicits. It's basically saying, well, I know that is true, so you can just cast it for me. And uh, that's absolutely fine. I'm not too proud of it, but it works. Once again, there might be a better way of doing it. But here we go. We can now define parsers. Um, so exactly A or exactly B are gonna consume input. A or B, same thing, like before, happily uh, compiling. Oh, and all of this is using uh, TUD. So everything actually compiles and is compiled before generating the slides, not making it up. Um, then we can define things like uh, wrapped, so just 
pass the parentheses, run the parser, pass the closing one, and return the value. So for any given parser, whether it consumes input or not, we know that we're gonna consume input in the end because we're gonna be passing the parentheses. You can uh, rewrite uh, maybe, maybe it's kind of the other way around. Well, it can fail. So there, there might be a pure, so we can't prove anything. So whatever you give me, the resulting parser is gonna be uh, false. Uh, we can redefine some and many, same way, some, if you give me a parser that consumes input, then if I run it multiple, at least once, I'm gonna consume input. But if you give me a parser that doesn't consume input, if I run it many times, still not gonna consume input. And many, obviously, could be a pure empty list, so we'll never, we can never prove that it's gonna consume input, basically. Um, the run function for it is actually exactly the same. I've, I've literally copy-pasted it, uh, I've called it run forget because this one simply does not look at the uh, boolean, simply ignores it and runs exactly the same way as before. What I've changed on the other hand is the um, two result. The difference is I only accept parser that do consume input because I don't want my user to give me a parser that doesn't consume because at runtime, basically I want my, my user to give me a parser that consumes so that I know that at runtime I'm gonna terminate, which is, uh, which is what Idris does and what I wanted to replicate in Scala. So that's all nice, A or Bs. Even the type inference works, which was a big surprise to be honest, but it's quite nice. So it, it knows that it has consume input. You can run it, it works, end of file, otherwise unexpected. And, but if you give it proper sum wrapped A or Bs, going to be passed happily. So that's quite nice. And if you define maybe, same thing, type inference still works. It says, well, that's, we can't prove anything about it. And if you try to run it, it's going to say, well, you're supposed to give me something that does consume input. I can't prove anything about your parser. I'm not going to run it. So that was extremely satisfying. And the, 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 the conclusion. <clears throat> so, a parser that calls itself um, into oblivion. And then, unfortunately, you can happily flat map and have like a proper parser that calls it. So if you don't get into the um, flat map bit, it's gonna happily fail, say, well, you didn't give me the dollar sign, so um, that's it, end of it. But if you do give it the dollar sign, then you do get into the flat map and then you're happily gonna stack overflow. Um, the, the reason for that, and it's obvious in hindsight, is that in Idris, you don't have unbounded uh, recursion. So the compiler can go like a step further and, and make sure that you don't do this kind of stupid thing. You, you can't do it, it won't compile. Whereas in Scala, you're totally fine. You can totally shoot yourself in the foot. Um, that's a different trade-off, obviously. But that's why it's simply not working in Scala. So the whole experiment is great to throw away. Um, I'm gonna leave you on, on, on this quote from, uh, from my manifesto. Uh, cynicism is the hope that someday you'll uh, have been, you know, have better, known better all along. Um, and as an actual bit more positive conclusion, I hope, um, That's the whole point, really. That, that's why we need to build step by step and try things. And I think even if it doesn't work, it still like opens our minds and gets you, well, gets us to understand better our tools and the limit of our tools and what we could get from somewhere else or what we should be looking at. And I think it's really important for everyone and all of us to, like, even if it's already been made, to still try to understand. The, the, the various decisions that were taken along the way. And maybe, you know, my use is different from your use, so I, I really want to have type level booleans. Thank you very much.